Can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. Look before you leap is an expression we sometimes take for granted. It's easy to overlook the distant consequences of our actions for that immediate gratification of solving a problem right in front of you. Sean Walker learns the hard way that trying to do the right thing can take you down a road that leads you to an unexpected destination. A hole in the ground. Sean knew instantly his wife was dead. The cause of her demise was obvious. Her hand, clawed in rigor mortis, clutched a small baggie with a dull white powder in it. Some of that powder was on her pinky. He reached out and touched her neck, like he'd seen people do in movies. Not only was it absent a pulse, it was cold. Marcy had died on their daughter's bed. It was apparent that she had been going through Tina's dresser, something they both did regularly to make sure she wasn't falling back into old habits, the kind that had landed her into rehab twice and gotten her expelled from school. Today, Marcy had found something. In the past, Tina had tried to fool them by leaving bags of powdered sugar or flour or talc tucked under her socks and underwear, hoping that her parents would stop snooping. But her efforts did not discourage their random inspections. Obviously, this time it was something much more potent than what their daughter had scrounged out of the kitchen or bathroom. Fentanyl was the first thing that came to Sean's mind. The drug had been in the news a lot lately. There had been some kids who had overdosed on drugs that had been laced with the narcotic in their town. They said that only a small quantity would kill you, and Marcy had discovered the truth of that the hard way. Sean couldn't help but think it could have been his daughter lying lifeless on her bed. For whatever reason... Tina obviously hadn't sampled the drug she had acquired, probably from that boyfriend of hers, Oz. He was grateful for that. He loved his daughter despite her troubles, and knew that Marcy, like himself, would gladly give her life for Tina. Unfortunately, Marcy stumbled across the opportunity to test that parental devotion, and had paid dearly. Sean checked his watch. Tina would be back from her GED classes soon. He picked up the phone to call 911 then put the handset back into its charger. Was calling the police what he really wanted to do? Police asked questions. A lot of questions. Questions like, where did the drugs come from? Obviously, with Tina's record, the attention of the authorities would be focused on her. Possession would be the least of her worries. Involuntary manslaughter charges could be brought against her. She wouldn't just spend a night in jail before being transferred to another round of rehab. Manslaughter meant prison. Even if it was only a few years, Tina would never recover from an experience like that. It would taint her forever. No, the police were not an option. Neither was allowing Tina to know the consequences of her indiscretion. Sean sat down on the bed next to Marcy's body. He leaned across her, then grabbed his wife's stiff arm and pulled her over his shoulders. She was light and he was strong, and despite the rigor keeping her from bending easily, he managed to hoist her up across his back and get to his feet. It was difficult negotiating the narrow hallways of their small home, and even more challenging carrying her down the stairs to the basement. He deposited her in the furnace room, laid her down in one corner, and covered her with some blankets he found in a storage container next to the holiday decorations. Next, he retraced his steps and erased any signs of his struggle transporting her through the house. He righted the lamp he had knocked over and straightened the framed photos in the hallway he had bumped askew. In Tina's room, he returned her dresser to order, straightened out the bed, and then tucked the baggie of white powder into his back pocket to dispose of later. When his daughter came home, Sean was sitting in his recliner, sipping a Coke, watching the afternoon ball game. How was school? he asked, as she made her way into the kitchen to stare at the open fridge, looking for something to eat. Fine, 
she answered, closing the fridge and grabbing a Twinkie from a cupboard. When no one chastised her for eating sugar-laden crap, she asked her father, Where's Mom? Sean was ready for this. He had practiced what he would tell Tina, how he would explain her mother's absence in a way that would hopefully put off for as long as possible the ugly truth. She left. Seemed kind of angry. I think she was putting away your laundry or something. Tina's eyes widened. She rushed into her room. Sean could hear her opening and closing drawers. Everything all right, sweetie? He asked. A moment later, Tina returned to the living room, her arms crossed. She dropped herself onto the sofa, obviously upset, but unwilling to explain why. Sean, of course, knew exactly why. Her drugs were missing, and the logical conclusion was that her mother had discovered them and had gone somewhere to dispose of them. Tina pulled out her phone and tapped furiously at the screen. She alternated between waiting for the phone to chime when an incoming text arrived and thumbing her response. After a few minutes, she got up and crossed to the front door. Where are you going? Sean asked. Out, she replied tersely, slamming the door behind her. Dad? Tina said in a soft but serious voice. Sean woke. He had been dreaming of Marcy, of when they were both younger and in high school. He blinked his eyes until they focused on his daughter, standing over his bed. Why is Mom's body in the furnace room? she asked. Sean stared at his daughter. How did she find out? It's not what you think, he instinctively replied. What do you think I think? What do you mean? Did you kill her? No, he insisted. How did she die? Sean remained quiet. He wasn't prepared to have this conversation with Tina. She probably thought that Marcy might have hidden her stash somewhere in the house and went searching. There weren't too many places to hide stuff, and now that he thought about it, the furnace room was probably a bad choice for where to conceal the body. I don't know, he lied. Tina didn't buy that for a second. Then why did you hide her? Why didn't you call an ambulance? That's what people normally do when someone dies. Sean sat up in the bed, but didn't offer an explanation. It didn't take Tina long to come to the obvious conclusion. Unless you didn't want the police involved, she said. It wasn't your fault, he told her, reaching out to grab her arm. Tina shook off his grasp. No, it's Oz's fault, she decided. That asshole tried to kill me. What? Sean asked. I should have never taken it from him. I should have flushed it down the toilet the second I got home, she said. You mean you didn't? Tina shook her head. No, she replied, offended. I broke up with him, and he made me take it as a parting gift. I was going to get rid of it. Mom found it. She didn't know, Sean told her. Tears welled in his daughter's eyes, then rolled down her cheeks. If we call the police, with your record, Tina nodded. What do we do? We tell people that she just got fed up, went to California. She always talked about wanting to go there. Grandma and Grandpa are dead, and she had no brothers and sisters, so no one will miss her but us. What do we do with the body? She asked, clarifying her question. I have an idea, Sean said. They walked through the woods behind their house, along a narrow trail that evaporated into a thicket of bushes and small trees. Once they pushed through, there was a rocky outcropping, a jumble of boulders jutting out from the forest floor. Your mother and I found this place years ago, Sean explained. He led Tina to a spot where there was a gap in the rocks, exposing a deep, dark hole in the ground. What is it? Tina asked. I think it's some kind of underground cavern. That's redundant, Dad. All caverns are underground, Sean smiled. I guess those GED classes are paying off, he remarked. Tina rolled her eyes. Sean picked up a small stone and tossed it into the hole. It was a couple of seconds before it made a sound, bouncing off unseen rocks beneath the surface. Your mom would throw dead animals she sometimes found down there, easier than burying them. No one will ever find her if we drop her down there. Tina considered the option. Seems a little disrespectful. No one will ever know she's there. We'll know. That's all who matters. She nodded her approval. Okay. That night, Sean wrapped Marcy's body in plastic sheeting, then rolled her into one of the blankets he had used to hide the body. He tied up the bundle with a few lengths of rope, 
Then he and Tina made their way back into the woods with Marcy slung over his shoulder, using the flashlight sparingly in case someone happened to glimpse them out of a kitchen window. When they reached the hole in the ground, Tina shined the light downward, but the beam was too weak to reach the bottom. Should we say something? She asked. If you like. Tina thought about it for a moment, then said, simply, Sorry, Mom. Sean lowered Marcy's enshrouded corpse into the hole and then let go. The next night, the two of them were watching TV when Tina's phone started dinging madly with incoming messages. She would glance at the screen from time to time, but didn't reply. Who is it? Sean finally asked. Oz, she replied. Why don't you block him? I kind of like to see how nuts it makes him that I won't reply. Sean understood. He wished he could see the delinquent who had been responsible for the corruption of his daughter and the death of his wife pay for his crimes, but there wasn't any way to do so without exposing Tina to more trouble. Oddly, he felt the two of them had grown closer because of the tragedy. Tina's phone chimed again. This time, after she looked at the screen, she tapped out a reply. I'm going over to Bev's place. Okay, Sean replied. Don't be too late. The phone rang. Sean glanced at the screen and saw that it was Tina's number. He answered. Hey, sweetie, what's up? Mr. Walker? A girl's voice asked. Yes? This is Bev, Tina's friend. Something happened. I think you should come over here. What is it? Where's Tina? Just come over. Hurry. Bev ended the call. Sean pulled on his jeans, found his car keys, and raced out of the house and to his old Honda. Bev's house was a couple of blocks away. The girls had been close since kindergarten, and Sean and Marcy and Bev's parents had been casual friends. When he got there, the front door was open. Sean walked inside and called out, Tina? Tina, are you here? In the bedroom, Bev replied. Sean hurried to Bev's room in the back of the house. He opened the door and found Bev kneeling over Tina. His daughter was staring blankly at the ceiling, her arms and legs twitching as if she was having a seizure. What happened? I don't know. Oz came over, and they had an argument. He ran out, and I found her like this. Sean noticed that there was a fine white powder on her face, around her nose and mouth. Did she take anything? No, Bev insisted. She was clean. I think he threw something at her. Sean thought back to the tiny amount of fentanyl that had killed Marcy. Had Tina absorbed enough of the drug to kill her, too? Give me a damp cloth, he instructed Bev. The frightened girl ran to the bathroom and returned with a washcloth soaked in water. Sean wrung it out a bit, then wiped the powder away from her face. Maybe it wasn't too late. He and Marcy had discussed getting some Narcan when they saw the news stories about the neighborhood kids who had died, just in case, but had never gotten around to it. He scooped Tina up in his arms and carried her out to the car. Should I call 911? Bev asked. No, I'll take her straight to the hospital, Sean told her, as he set his daughter in the passenger seat then got behind the wheel and sped off. It was late, and there was no traffic. Sean was kind of hoping a policeman would pull him over. Maybe the cop would have a dose of the life-saving antidote in his car, but none were present along the three-mile-long route between Bev's house and the hospital. When he pulled up into the ER parking lot, he turned to his daughter. Hang in there, sweetie, he said. The twitching had stopped some blocks earlier, and now he noticed that along with it, her shallow breathing had ceased as well. Tina, he shouted, shaking her by the shoulders. Tina, wake up! But it was too late. She was gone. Sean stared at the door to the emergency room. But what was the point? He put the car back into gear and drove home. On the way, though, he stopped at Oz's house. The boy was hanging out on the street, sitting on the hood of his car, smoking and joking with a few of his friends. Sean parked a few houses away then got out of the car and approached Oz and his gang. They stopped talking when they saw him approach. What do you want, old man? Oz asked. Sean replied by cold-cocking the boy, laying him out on the hood. Another boy grabbed his arm, but Sean whirled around and smacked his elbow directly into the kid's nose. The other boys backed off. Sean started checking Oz's pockets until he finally found what he was looking for, a small bag of white powder. He tore it open and poured it into the boy's mouth. Oz started coughing, then rolled off the hood onto the pavement. Sean didn't stay to see what happened next. He returned to his car and continued home. He gently carried Tina into the house and set her on the couch, 
while he retrieved a length of rope from the basement. Then he grabbed the baggie Marcy had found in Tina's room from its hiding place, wrapped in foil in the freezer, and shoved it in his back pocket. With Tina's petite body slung over his shoulder, he made his way through the woods to the hole in the ground. Sean couldn't bear the thought of just tossing his daughter into the unknown depths. He tied the rope around her chest, then gently lowered her down until the line slackened and tossed it down after her. There really wasn't any reason to go on. The only thing left for him was a prison sentence for murdering Oz. He pulled the baggie out of his back pocket, tilted his head back, and poured the white powder it held into his mouth. As he stood on the edge of the hole in the ground, he could feel his heart racing. He tried to take in a breath, but was unable to. His vision darkened, and with his last conscious action, Sean stepped into the hole. He landed on something hard. It was painful for only a brief moment. Shock erased whatever the drugs didn't dull, and he could feel his life fading away as he lay against something soft. But before he died, he heard a voice in the dark ask, Dad, is that you? Thank you for listening to A Hole in the Ground, written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, rate us on Apple, Spotify, and Audible, and share these stories with anyone who enjoys audiobooks. My latest novel, Afterlife, A Rainy Day Investigation, is available now on Amazon and Audible. You can listen to the first book in this paranormal mystery series, Near Death, on this very podcast for free. Just visit bedtimestories.studio. And while you're there, sign up for our email list to be notified of new episodes and exclusive offers, and get a free bookmark. You can visit richhusick.com to learn more about the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs. Thanks again, and all the very best.